All right, man. We got a great guest tonight in the live room at World Music Nashville podcast. 2020, my good friend and one of my favorite people that comes in the store, Vinny Smith of V-Pix, brother. Boy, that's a, that's a big <laughs> build, a big name to try to match up with. And uh, Will and Dax are here, of course. Absolutely. And uh, we're going to talk to Vinny about V-Pix, right one on. of our favorite products to sell. I have to tell you this, Vinny. Like, when I first started here, <laughs> and Dax, Dax agrees with me, my... The thing I hated to sell more than anything was picks. Absolutely. Why? Why? Well, they were under the counter. Yeah, they, we had we didn't have them in a good. They weren't in a good place. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> and uh, you know, you have to feel. You know, it's something people have to feel. Everybody that buys it's, the picks, it's they a actually, tactile experience. A, absolutely, it's a physical tactile thing, and. Uh, Worse than selling single strings to yes, people. Yes, it was very. Uh, <laughs> it was weird. It was just I don't know. It just it was time consuming. You'd have to get all the trays out and put them on the counter, and then it, it's worked so much better. Half the people, time the tray would fall. Yeah, it was a mess. All over the floor. We didn't have enough room. Now we've got that whole section that's a pick section now, and people can actually. Oh, okay, I get it. And I tell you, since we've done that, we have sold so many more picks. And your picks, especially. Well, I I agree, I, I agree with that. Um, when I set up a dealer, I always tell them, if you will put these by your cash register, um, people are going to buy them because they're going to pick them up. They're going to say, what's this? Mm -hmm. When they're out of sight, they're out of mind. And I actually just tell my dealers, you know, if, if you're down a few skews because you think somebody's lifted a couple, just tell me. Yeah. Shoot, I give... 100 SKUs a day away anyway. So, right. You know, um, and you're right. If they're up there, they can look at them, feel them. Feel them, them. yeah. But so. now, I, I mean, that was my own. Like, I had, ne I had never worked in a music store before, worked here. And uh, that was the one thing I just dreaded that's, when people come in. And it's something we funny. sell every day. That's funny. It's like, oh, another pick customer. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think we talked about that on the first podcast that, we were, it was just all people that worked here. Another, like, what is your worst thing to another sell? Another big customer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, me and Dax both always said, man, the picks. And, we, and that was our fault. We just didn't have them in a good place. So Yeah, they did keep them down in the counter. Down could, in the counter. You could see them, but you might want not want to go, hey, man, can I check these out? Yeah, yeah. It was or if a, somebody who didn't happen to be there, right. and you're going to walk by, and you're going to forget about them. Yeah. It was a... Uh, oh, yeah. that explains why you guys sell so many more now. We sell a lot more now, and it's easier for us, and I think the customers like it a lot better, and uh, yeah, it all works out great. Absolutely. Do you like selling picks? Well? <laughs> I, don't, I don't mind selling picks. I think selling picks is kind of like... I was never with y'all when you were, you were selling picks to what you're talking about. But even like when you have the display cases out, and uh, when people know what they want, that's great. Uh -huh. And I love selling V picks and the special kind of picks where you can kind of talk about them and explain. It, this is know, what's special about. That's this. where I was going when I opened the conversation. Was it's taught me so much more about playing, talking about talking to you and talking to people about their picks and. Like we have a lot of customers. The same people come in, return customers, and buy the same picks and they talk about why they use this pick and i never considered that before i started working here hmm. i just thought of something too and when, when you're saying about when you were talking about uh, getting the display case out and you're standing there the customer's probably feeling a little hurried sure and they might not take the time to really pay attention to what's in that case because they're kind of they're yeah, kind of yeah, looking yeah, yeah. things over real quick because they don't want to take up your time. They don't want to be rude about it. Absolutely. But when it's over there and they can just stand there and look at them. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know, I just never had considered picks. I mean, I always use the same kind of pick and until I came here. And I just got into same. this whole pick world. And I used a green Tortex 88 for about 30 years, 25 yeah. years. Would have never dreamt of the big 1980. Yeah. It would have seemed preposterous. I didn't know anything really about different picks until the V picks. Right. I didn't either until Absolutely. I talked to Vinny. Really? Yeah, me too. I could definitely say that. That's just so funny. Because... I wouldn't even know why you would have made one. I wouldn't have thought to make one so big. It would have just seemed ridiculous. And now I can't play with a normal pick. No, I can't either. 
That's fun. <laughs> that's funny to me because I questioned it from the start. I, I guess they just didn't feel right to me. The and picks didn't ever feel they, right. They never felt right to wins. me, and they didn't sound right to me. And all I knew was when I when I would hold a pick, especially a flimsy one, if I would play with this shoulder up here, and if I was always like. I always used to play upstrokes. Everything was an upstroke. Sure. This is the way I used to play, just yeah. like this. And um, I got tired of that, and I found that if I would pick up a seashell or a piece of wood, I, f I found that the sound was fatter, and I got that same tone that I was playing sure. when I was playing everything with an upstroke. Uh -huh. And um, really what I was doing, if you think about playing everything with an upstroke, as I was um, playing Albert King. Because if you think about it, he played everything with the downstroke, mm -hmm. but the guitar was upside down. And so playing with the downstroke for him was really playing upstroke, up, upstroke yeah, for yeah. us, uh, you know, in direction with the string. And I guess that that's what I was doing was sound like Albert King, but um, that's, I questioned it from the start. <laughs> I, 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 and so in 1980, when I designed that, I was playing with this real popular band in in california and i would make these picks during the day i worked in a garage and there was grinders there and everything and i would make these picks during the day and i just come up with silly little ideas but i love this stuff called cast acrylic i didn't know it was called cast acrylic then it, it was called plexiglass that's all i knew was you called it plexiglass and aquariums were made out of it the first time yeah. i saw it because I was really into saltwater aquariums, like really into them, and uh, and the, and they they had the, the plexiglass had the rounded corners. So the first time I saw a sheet of plexiglass, I was just fat, just infatuated with it, and I grabbed it, went home, cut out some picks, and they were pretty much this shape right here. This, they were about that big, and they were there. I don't know why I ended up with that shape, but I did. I. Did you just eyeball it? Yeah, I drew I drew it out on a piece of paper. I still have the little the little piece of paper <laughs> that I drew it out. <laughs> I do, and I drew it out on a p and then I, you know what a Dremel is, mm -hmm. of course. I cut I cut it out with a Dremel. Sure, yeah. It's a wonder I didn't lop a finger off. Right. I cut it out with a Dremel, and then I um, went down to the to the line on the grinder, mm -hmm. and I ground them. There was a kid named Jocko, and he used to clean the shop. And he was uh, going to high school at the time. And he would take, he'd go, you want me to buff those edges for you? And I didn't even know because I, I didn't spend much time in high school. I pretty sure. much just fell out of high school. And um, he says, you want me to buff those edges for you and make them smooth again? So I said, well, I kind of like the way it sounds right now, but yeah, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. So some of them were buffed and some of them weren't. Mm -hmm. but most of them I just played real raw like that 1980 is because it got this <laughs> noise with every note. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, all I knew is I sounded like Brian May and Ed King from Leonard Skinner. Uh -huh. Those are the two people that had that weird <laughs> sound, right? Yeah. Well, is that why it's called the 1980? Yeah, that's, because I made it in 1980. That's exactly <laughs> that's cool. how I made picks. Did you know that? And, and I think the, he and I had yeah. talked about it before. And, the, and then yeah. uh, I found out later, of course, that Ed King was had played Sweet Home Alabama with a seashell. A seashell. A, a seashell this thick. You know, uh, he. I, I, and again, I should have brought one because he autographed one for me and gave oh, it to cool. me when he started playing my picks. And, um, and then Brian May plays with a coin, much like a dime. It's got a serrated edge on it, uh, and it's called a sixpence. It's just like a, it's about the size of a penny, but it's got the little serrate, sure. serrated edges on it. So it gets a uh -huh. So all I knew is when I played these things real scratchy like that, without polishing the edges, I sounded like those two guys. And it did. It came across the amp wonderfully. Yeah. And um, that's where it got started. That's fantastic. That is That's, so cool. That is awesome. That's, I just did it because, story. and I didn't like again. I didn't like a regular guitar pick, a flimsy, because man, it, it just, it, it, I, it just, I just couldn't play with them very good. Uh -huh. I couldn't play fast. Uh, everything had to be on an upstroke, or they just sounded terrible. I think I saw Santana too, and I think he was playing on an upstroke with everything back in those mm -hmm. days too. You know, he uses your picks, don't he? Yeah, yeah. He he doesn't use them all the all the time. He still uses his Dorito. Uh huh which is shaped like this one. 
but it's a lot bigger. Uh-huh. I've got one at the house. I took off his amp. And uh, he still plays that, but he also plays the freakishly large round, of which I think you guys have some of those uh-huh. up there. I think so. Uh, mandolin players really like those. They're, but they got a rounded corner on them. They don't yeah. have a pointed corner. They you got like rounded. the pointed corner? I, I like the pointed corner. You like the pointed one, yeah. Um, mandolin players kind of are in two... Two, two schools of thought. One does like a real pointed pick. And I used to think it was the old timers that um, that like the, the rounded and the, and the younger people that like the pointed. But I remember one time, my, one of my first NAMs, this, this old man came up to me and I thought he was going to whoop my butt one day. He came up to me and he goes, you the guy that gave me this pick yesterday. It was, it was called a large pointed, um, 2.75 millimeter. About, about that size right there, maybe a little smaller. Goes, you got, you're the guy that gave me this pick yesterday, right? I go, oh, yeah. He was about 75, looked like he was getting ready to grab my nose or something over the <laughs> counter. And he goes, I make my own picks out of hawk, Bill. But this right here, it's the... No. Wow. That's what he said. He said, this is the... Sh-. You can say that. <laughs> oh, this is the <laughs> shit. <laughs> and I laughed, I laughed and laughed. And he, he, he bought a bunch of them from me then at, at Nam that day. He goes, man, I can't believe this. And uh, he was the first mandolin player that I met. That, Cheers. What, what pick was that again that he was? That, the large pointed. Large pointed. And I think that you have some up there on the Woodstock series, large pointed. Right on. He loved that. Now, Vince Gill, I gave Vince picks for years and years. <laughs> because he's a mandolin player, you know. I believe it. I've from heard. from way back, and um, one day he finally goes, you know, Vinny, I I I I only like rounded picks. You're always giving me these pointed ones. I like rounded picks. I said, well, Vince, you've never told me that, brother. <laughs> so now he gets a handful of rounded picks. Right on. Wow. <clears throat> That's, that, awesome. that's another thing that w- when I first discovered the V pick, like I just looked at all the people that are playing them, and they're all guys that I like really look up to. Hmm, I was like, absolutely, I, yeah. Don't you think? Definitely. Like the you know who really like he's not my favorite guitar player. I just like it, uh, their stuff. Is uh, the late Walter Becker? Oh yeah, Walter was a he was a wonderful person. I yeah. loved Walter. He played your he played my picks and he. he did. If you're if you've ever seen his rig rundown on on YouTube, uh-huh. have you guys watched that rig? Rundown? I think I have. Seen. I, don't, I don't think I've seen that. Watch one. it and fast. Or don't fast forward. Watch the whole thing. But you'll see they go to this trap because they're getting ready to do a show, and and there's the trap is sitting right next to him, mm-hmm. trap case. Yep. And he's got about twenty five V picks laying all out on the top. He's got the colossal. He's got the insanity. The one that's uh-huh. even. The one that's a half an inch thick. Uh-huh. He loved the thick picks. Walter did. And and all the way down to the you can hear that I can hear that he loved them and he used to I I'd ask well which one you use on Josie or this or that and his tech is he's the one that I always would talk to as his tech I never talked to Walter really I wish I I wish I could have but he was kind of to himself I guess sure um anyway he would say just right before the song Walter would just look at that bunch of picks and just say I think I like the sound of this one on this song. Wow. He said that that's what Walter would do. All night he was playing V picks. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really neat. And about twice a year he would order about fifteen hundred dollars worth of V picks from me. Wow. Pow. I don't know if he gave them away or lost them. I uh, I lost a good customer when I lost well, not a, not only did we lose a good guitar player, I lost a good customer. Sure. Uh do you so like going back to that origin story about you making the pick? Did, was that all the research and development you did? I mean, it looks like you just do all kind. You get input from players. I and, do, and you just kind of like go off of that. This is uh, some. Sometimes our picks are designed because people have a request that I fulfill, like the chicken picker. Mm-hmm. That. That pick I went to uh, when I first started coming out to Nashville. No, I take that back. When I first moved to Nashville, and I was able to just spend a lot of time just walking around Nam, and sure. I, I called these guys that were playing. I called them country shredders because they're playing a billion notes and like um, a Brent Mason type. More than that, I'm yeah. talking uh-huh. players like that, and uh, they're all using tiny picks. So I thought, you know, I need to come up with a little pick that plays real fast like that. And, and then the chicken picker, 
I don't know what you guys think about this, but I'm going to say it anyway because I always do. I think that a lot of my ideas come from God mm -hmm. because I'm not saying I got a, a special connection with him or nothing like that. <laughs> I believe you do. But I get up in the morning sometimes with this idea in my head. It, it's just there. And I, I can't tell you where it comes from. That's awesome. So you That's tell, like a song or so something. So you tell me where it comes from. Yeah, I don't I, know. I think it comes from God myself. Um Cheers, man. Yeah, and, that's awesome. And, and, that's uh, great. Like this spirit. Now, th this one was inspired by, uh, we, we found a different, Nancy found a different uh, supplier for material, and she she found this purple stuff. She goes, what do you think of that? And I said, man, I, I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Well, one, you know, I had a heart attack a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I was in the hospital, and again, this pick popped in my mind, and I originally thought it was going to be a base pick. I called it the EKG. Mm -hmm. You guys got them out there. They got the little EKG logo uh -huh. on it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> that was originally designed for a base because it's bigger, and it's the exact same shape as this. It, the, the sides are, are much straighter than a regular guitar pick, and they're, this, this point is this, this pick is very to the point when it comes to its sound. It knows what it wants to sound like. You can tell what this pick is going to sound like by looking. It's very intentional. There's no way you can play that pick and be not aggressive. Mm -hmm. That's a very intentional sound right there. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had already done the EKG, which turned out really funny because Nancy goes, nobody's going to want that pick. We, we laugh because she'll say, oh, yeah, I sold another EKG to this hour. You know, nobody's going to buy that pick. Sure. She says that. And she makes <laughs> kind of mocks herself because she says that. But um, That's exactly the same shape as the EKG just shrunken down. Because uh -huh. I didn't have a smaller version of that EKG. Um, I think I think Billy Sheehan's got those EKGs too. He wow. plays, he doesn't play pick very often. But when he does, it's, you know, it's a V pick. Interesting. Right on. So that's very cool. But I, I don't know why, but I've always been able. If if I want to get a certain sound that I'm hearing in my head, or if a customer tells me a, a certain sound that they want, I can tell you what shape is going to, what bevel and what point's mm. going to give you that sound. I can do that. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why I can do that. I've always been able to do that. So it's, it's just been there. So yeah, if I was amazing. going for a, uh, comparatively, let's say I wanted to do a uh, Metallica song and a Fleetwood Mac song, what picks would I need? Well, the Fleetwood Mac song, you would definitely want a rounder <laughs> pick, or no pick at all, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, because he, does, he Lindsay, doesn't, doesn't play with a pick. Well, he it? does once in a while. When he plays that Strat, he, uh -huh. and when he gets those harmonics, he yeah. plays with a pick. Um, but usually not. So you would want... Either no pick, or you would want to play with a pick with a with a with a roundness to it, kind of like that. That would give you that thumpy. Lin Lindsay's very thumpy sounding. Um, in reality, he's sliding his fingers over. He's actually hitting the strings, mm -hmm. um, and his finger now, and he's kind of going like that. So it doesn't have a sharp attack. There's no point to that sound at all. It's a uh, it, it's what you would call a slow release. When you play with a pointy pick like the screamer. That's a very fast point of release. Uh, it's a multi-second, but it, it's a different release than that is going to be, okay? And so that, yeah. Now, a metallic sound, or Metallica sound, rather, you would want something like the, the Screamer. This is our number one seller, and I think a lot of the people that buy it are uh, metal players. Or the Medium Pointed, which is the same point is this but the but the bevel if you look at that bevel it starts way back on the pick and it goes way out like this mm -hmm. where a medium pointed it it's it's a more of a round bevel like this it's more shaped like like that yeah so it's got that sl again that slow point of release um a lot of metal players really like that right on or and then I have a dagger shaped pick that I don't even know how some people play. It's called <laughs> it's called a switchblade, and a lot of metal players like this. <clears throat> the screamer, though, the funny thing about that is is uh, I had to make it a at one point. Uh, somebody probably requested it. I had to make an acoustic guitar pick. 
Well, I'm not an acoustic player, but I did know that that um, an acoustic guitar sounds the best when you mix it opposite of the hi hat mm -hmm. because it has an acoustic guitar has the same attack if you think about it mm -hmm. that a hi hat does. And like when you listen to the Eagles, they would mix the acoustic guitar opposite of the hi hat. It just it was in the same realm. Mm -hmm. So I knew that 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 my acoustic pick was going to have to have that attack that that a drumstick hitting a hi hat would have. to have. <coughs> Excuse so me. that's where I came up, and I something told me again. That's why that bevel. This is the only pick that has that bevel. It's a very hard bevel to make. Let me tell you, it, it was. I, I hated it when people would order forty or fifty of them from me. It would take me all day just to do that order because I had to do that bevel. Has now, your, that's wow. the screamer. That's the screamer. That's the best selling. Pick that's right our now. number one selling pick right now. Wow. Um, and it was originally designed as our acoustic, and um, then electric players, <laughs> then electric players got it. We were still in California, and I remember my, I remember where my wife was sitting. She was sitting at her computer, and I got another phone call. Man, this pick just screams, dude. An electric player got a hold of it. Man, this pick just screams, sure. dude. They kept saying that over and over. So I remember walking in the house out of the garage. I was making picks, got off the phone, and I said, that acoustic pick? Yeah. I said, add it on the website, call it the Screamer, and now we're going to sell it two different ways, the acoustic and the Screamer. And uh, it, immediately it was number one. And it, it has been number one. Consistently. The years yeah, I probably sell eight thousand of those a year. Wowza! That's my guess. I bet you, I bet you, I sell eight thousand, maybe ten thousand of that pick a year. Jeez, oh Pete, that's a lot of that's, that's a, a lot, lot of, of picks. <laughs> just for a just for I, I mean, if I was Jimmy Dunlop, it, it's not. He sells eight thousand picks in a week. Yeah, of course. But for a for a for a little handmade. So are they still made by hand? I was going to ask if your process has changed much it from has 1980. Changed a lot. They're still, I should say, they're still trimmed by hand. Meaning, uh, okay, I'll, I'll say I'll answer that question like this: When a pick sells over 1,500 picks a month, that's kind of a lot more than we can handle because we grind these things by hand. We cut them out with a laser originally. They get cut out, and the logo gets put on them. Then we hand grind them on a buffer, and then we and then we we flame buff them. I mean, on a buffer, on a grinder, and then we and then we buff them. Now that's a lot of manpower, and a guy, a good employee, can probably pop out 500 picks, maybe three to 500 picks a day. But this one right here was such a butt kicker making with that bevel. And, and plus, I wanted the bevel perfect because it's my number one selling pick. So a pick that sells over that, we then have a mold made. We have it put in a mold. But there's a lot of logistics and studying going because the mold that makes that pick is $10,000. Ouch. I have to sell a lot of picks to get that money back. Mm -hmm. So um, not just, just any pick just doesn't go in a mold, of course. And every year we, we we put about three picks in a mold mm -hmm. per year, and the the chicken picker is the latest that, that that went into a mold. You sell enough of those to justify the mold. Yes, gotcha. Um, and we and we justify the mold also by it would really we would we would have to take a lot of time away from other things just to keep these in stock. Mm -hmm. And so and then but we still have to hand trim them when they come out of the mold and. You know, that's there's still yeah, there's still a lot of man, there's still some handy some hand, work. hand hand handmade hand work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when they come out, a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's just a machine spitting the things out like yeah, yeah. popcorn, but it's not. I wish uh, it was. <laughs> I wish I could pay ten thousand dollars that it was. How many <laughs> employees do you have? I don't know. Yeah. Um, are, are Nancy and I counted as employees? Really, sure. we are, right? Okay. Audrey, my daughter, Nancy, me. Krista is the one that follows up for our stores. Brenner, of which you guys know, mm -hmm. makes picks. Jake. And then I have another guy that helps me online. Um, 
hope I'm not forgetting somebody. Do you have a sale? So probably seven, yeah. Is there a sales guy that goes all over? Or? That's you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have... And a, what, there couldn't be a better salesperson for the VP. I have a lady that does sales for me on the phone. Um, she doesn't go out and get new stores, but she um, calls the stores every two to three months. And yeah. How's your picks doing? And they, they really like her. Now, I take care of you guys. I like to take care of all the people around Nashville just because I Absolutely. Know That's one of the selling points because I tell – I mean, I'm sure you guys do too. Like, hey, these are made right here. Right here. And we know Vinny. And, yeah, that's a big selling point for when us. When I first met Billy, he was over at uh, another store, uh -huh. a huge store here in town. And and he goes, wow. What? And then they told him about V-Picks, and he'd heard of them. Mm -hmm. And so he bought a bunch of them when he was there. And then they go, well, why don't you go over and see Vinny? He goes – V picks are from Nashville. <laughs> he didn't know. They go, yeah. Next thing I know, I get a phone call that he's on his way, and I look out the front door, and and at that time, I just moved to that ranch, and there was a cattle gate. You know what a cattle yeah, gate absolutely, is? Yeah, absolutely. You see, you buy them out of tractor supply. Yeah, yeah. There's at a cattle gate right in front of my shop, and here's Billy Gibbons getting out of this little minivan, reaching over my cattle gate, trying oh, to get. Oh, that's funny. I go, Audrey. That's Billy Gibbons. <laughs> Check it out. And wow. Here, here he comes through my cattle gate. That, That's that cool, is, man. That's awesome. What's his pick? What are the picks does he like? Billy, same thing as you, the tradition light, light, but I leave his unbuffed. Okay. Real scratchy. Yeah. I, 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 see that. I yeah. I use the, the the most coarse grinder that we have for Billy's picks. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I'll even drag him across a real coarse piece of sandpaper. I mean the kind it's it's almost like cement. It's so coarse. Like 80 grit. Oh, or something. yeah. Just really rough. And Billy likes that. He does, yeah. Boy, he's, he likes if anybody that. likes it, he does. He likes that. He gave me one of his uh, one of his pesos. I made oh, him, really? I made him take it out of his wallet and give it to me. Oh, that's really cool, man. <laughs> What's the thinnest pick you make? It's not that, here, okay. but it's called the Tradition Ultralight and the Large Pointed Ultralight. I don't know if you guys got them. Or I don't right. think we have any in this. Um, mm -mm. I'm, Maybe we might have one. I, I'm not crazy about thin picks, so I guess. Yeah, I was, that's the I, reason I, I asked the question because I generally these picks are. Yeah, you know, they're not. I've got, I've got them. I've, I've got picks with flex. They're a little bit different uh, material. Mm -hmm. These are my own special. Some of these picks are my own special uh, form of acrylic that I like to have made, um, which is why they have this. This gripping factor to them, you know. Mm -hmm. Not all acrylic does that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's a heavy pick right there. Absolutely. And this chicken picker is not, but. That's so cool. There's eight different grades of cast acrylic. See that thing pick sticking to me? Yeah. That's because it, it clings to your fingers when it gets warmed up. You know, you mm -hmm. know the feel. It's just weird how it does it. And uh, there's eight different grades of cast acrylic. Two of them do that. Not all of them do that. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> I was asking what oh. the thinnest pick was. Oh, the thinnest the pick. The ultralight. Okay. Yeah. I was. I was. I was going to get to that. <laughs> it's a different form. It's a different grade of material mm -hmm. because this will not flex at all. Mm -hmm. This will snap on you in a second. Um, so I do add a, a, another ingredient on those, and those are called the ultralight series. Gotcha. And they're 0. 0.8 millimeter. Okay. And they do. They sound. Really good. Mm -hmm. uh, the only time I'll play them normally, for me personally, is on acoustic guitar. Again, when I want it to sound like that hi hat and get that, you know, that mm -hmm. that crisp, sure, attack to that hi hat. Hmm. Same thing. What's the oddest pick you've had to make? <laughs> has, well, some, has somebody sent you a request for like? Yeah, yeah, and I don't really do a giant V pick. <laughs> I don't really do requests anymore right. uh, because, well, you know they they want me to to do it, and I spend about an hour researching and figuring it out, and then they'll say, yeah, okay, I want two of them. Well, uh, you know yeah, I can't yeah. do that. Our our minimum run is thirty picks to go sure. to the shop. I mean, if I'm if I'm gonna take a guy off of his project that he's working on, and I'm going to say, here, you need to do this. I can't do that for two picks. I got gotcha, you, yeah. I lose money. Right. And unfortunately, when you run a business, it's a money thing. Absolutely. Those, those people want it. paychecks. And so, um, so yeah, our minimum run is 30 to go through. But one thing that, that uh, people have requested is, 
If you could imagine this pick right here, if it was if it was really pointy, and they want two points and one round, okay? Now, and I've I've absolutely even if they order thirty of them, I won't do it because it mm. it never turns out like they think it's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ugly, first of all. Sure. It, it, it I don't know. It looks just real. Just imagine that pick right there with with another, another point, point on, on it, and then yeah. this is round. And they always end up sending them back to me saying, "Man, I'm not happy with that." So I, now, when and I get that request about every three months, and I say, "Believe me, brother, you don't you want don't this. want you think you want it, but you don't." That's that's the weirdest. I guess that's the weirdest request. We get some weird ones sometimes. Do you get? Uh, do you are you constantly looking at different materials or no. like you just no. stick on that one? No, absolutely not. I I have. I fell in love with this material in 1980, and, and I have. It, it's a little problematic, and I think that one reason that pick makers never used it is because it's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And and when you buy a four by six sheet of it, some of that stuff you and it's very expensive, and some of that stuff you throw away because it's there's 20 percent difference in variance on mm -hmm. thickness. Mm -hmm. From 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 one foot away, the stuff is poured on glass, and it's not poured in a mold. It's poured on glass, and it might have a top on it where they squash it down, but it's just not the same thickness. So some of it gets thrown away, but the way it grips to your fingers and the way this sounds, to me, is worth all the problems that, that it the dealing with it, dealing with it, it. it comes yeah. up. Yeah, I got you. And and if you think about it, here in Nashville, you know, you know, Brent Mason, all those guys, they all got fake fingernails. You know, sure, that. absolutely. Guess what they're made out of? That stuff, cast acrylic. <laughs> That's awesome. It's the exact that. same stuff. <laughs> wow. Do you guys? <laughs> do you sell overseas? Yeah, we do. We do. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready. Just we're just now putting a huge order together for Germany. It's going to go out on Monday, but we sell a, a gross amount to Germany, Japan, and uh, the UK. UK, yeah, and and they kind of and, and other countries too. But those are my biggest, yeah, biggest ones. And then uh, we're just now breaking into China, and I'm in the middle of um, getting a Chinese um, trademark. China's trying to change their ways, you know. They're they're they, trying to. Do they're some, trying. Yeah, I know what you're talking you about. You know, um, I'm I'm sure they're they're getting tired of the people not wanting to do business with them, as I haven't for many years, um, just because they're going to get ripped off. You know, they're just so they're so known for this rip off thing, and I there's no copyright laws or there mm. there's not. They don't have it. Um, so, and to them, it's not wrong. Yeah, they don't. It's just a way of life to them. Yes. A lot of countries are that way. Um, but to become part of the fair trade in the world and the free trade of the world and to really get people, they're, they're doing things like you have to have a trademark now. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a, a good-sized company, and I guess they're considering me a good-sized company because they're making me do that, I have to get a trademark. And then they can protect me. They can't protect me if I don't have anything trademarked. Mm -hmm. So the trademark went through, I found out, and it hasn't been released to me. It won't be released to me for, I think, like another six weeks or something mm. so um and you, then are you then, gonna go over there no <laughs> i hear i'll be a real tall person if i do though i've been told or you better get a surgical mask because <laughs> yeah, for right now right now <laughs> um no no you I, would be taller i don't you? i don't tr i don't uh, travel very well right well i mean you i guess you wouldn't need to well no I, I and i don't plan to because they one of the guys that i deal with actually lives in the midwest yeah his name is Kale. Like and the like, like the just like the plant. plant. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and uh he lives in the Midwest and and so if I have to deal with anybody face to face, I deal with Kale. Sure. And um, I, I don't I don't have any desire to go out of the United States. Yeah. Not, none whatsoever. Was I, it going back to nineteen eighty from like an entrepreneurial angle, was it was it years before this took off as a career oh was oh, that a difficult process oh yeah oh yeah um yeah i, I made them and i gave a bunch of them to friends that was the r&d was there anything like it at that time no 
Absolutely not. So you Nothing. were the first and completely. I was one really of the. There was another pick that was called the Stone Pick, and it looked a lot like this Farley here. It's about that thick, and and the guy had an ad in the in Guitar Player magazine, and it used to say, it was a picture of him, and he said, "I guarantee I can play faster than you with this pick." That, that's what he said. Wow, and my so buddy Jesse Hampton. He was a big, he's a buddy of mine. He's a big hero of mine. He played those. So they were, a, looking back, they were a bit of an inspiration, those stone pick was. But really, the only other people that made picks were Fender. Gibson made picks a lot back in those days. You know, Dario Dario and people like that. Um, but boutique pick makers, no. He, he was the only boutique pick that I knew of. And even when I started making them again, in 2004, there was no Red Bear and all those guys. No, none of those people were around. Blue Chip wasn't around. Um, I was pretty much the first because Stone Picks had closed down. Hmm. And I, as far as I know, I was, but I, I was, I was making them. I started making them, and I, and, and again, I was in this real popular band, and and. I was making these picks, and I give them to all my buddies and people that show up. I give them to them, and then I just go to work and make a whole bunch of them the next day or the next week. And um, then Eddie Van Halen came out, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not an Eddie Van Halen fan. <laughs> I, I, I know he made his mark, and, sure. and I admire Eddie. I don't know Eddie, but I hear he's a, a great guy. Um, he made his mark, but I couldn't stand listening to that. That <laughs> to me, it sounded like a turkey goblin. <laughs> <laughs> Think yeah. about it. It, it. And it made no sense. Never heard it quite explained that way. But I, yeah, I guess I, I can see that. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. And and I was working in the studio. I was working in studios at the time. I was a producer in one of the studios. And, and people kept asking me to do that stuff. And... I didn't want to do it, and I didn't like to do it. I would do it occasionally when I had to do it, but it just got to where it just irked me. And then, it, and then of course, and then Steve Vai came out doing it. He started doing the same stuff, and and guitar playing changed its direction greatly in the '80s. Mm. I liked guitar players like Don Felder from the Eagles, and and Joe Walsh? and Brian May and Joe Walsh. You know, they weren't playing like they were getting paid by the note. Mm -hmm. And um, I just couldn't stand what guitar was doing. And so um, there was this guy that showed up on an Eagles record. His name was David Sanborn. And he played saxophone on one of the songs called Sad Cafe. And I listened to that and I said, that's what I want to do. So I sold off all my guitars. I didn't have a lot of them back then, but I had some nice ones. And I sold them off for, you, you couldn't give a Les Paul back in those days. I think I gave, I think I sold that black custom Les Paul for 300 bucks. Wow. As a matter of fact, I know I did. Jeez. Um, God. Yeah, that's stupid, isn't it? When I stand up, you can kick me. <laughs> um, and I bought saxophones. So you quit playing guitar. I completely quit playing guitar. I kept one guitar, and I remember it was a real junky um, Stratocaster with a three bolt neck on it, remember yeah. the old 78? Absolutely. With a three bolt neck, you could literally move the neck like that when you're playing it. It was yeah, absolutely. terrible, terrible guitar. Uh, for some reason, I kept that one instead of the Black Les Paul. And you went all in on the sax? All in the sax, and I played sax for about four or five years. It's all I did. And I, I came successful at it. I mean, you know, we did shows with people like Charlie Daniels and Hank Williams Jr. and stuff. Sure. You know, we were up there with the big boys. We were, you know, the band playing with their band, sure. that kind of thing. And so I was doing okay. I was hooting on the sax, and then, um, doing, believe it or not, doing mostly country music. Yeah, because country was real popular in the '90s. It was more popular than it is now. Well, least, I was going to say the, the sax. Coast. The sax. The '80s was the decade of the sax, right? It was for rock music. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But in the '90s, a lot of country bands were Merle Haggard and, Merle and they, they were using sax, horn yeah. sections yeah. and stuff. So absolutely, that's what I was pretty much doing. I was playing alto sax and horn section. And um, anyway, um, this one band called me up, and he goes, "Hey, I, I need you to come and do a job for me tonight." 
And I don't know why I did this. I go, well, what do you want me to play? And he goes, well, bring your sax. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm really a better guitar player than I am a sax player. I think that I started think I think I started listening to those guitar parts, and they were playing like Don Felder used to play in the middle of the '70s. Mm -hmm. They weren't doing this nonsense. They were mm -hmm. playing melodies. Sure. And um, I said, "Well, I'm really, I'm a better guitar player than I am a sax player." And he goes, <laughs> "I never forget his name was Barry Day." He goes, "Well, that's good because you suck at the sax." Wow. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he <laughs> said to me. <laughs> <laughs> you suck at the sax. So I took my guitar that night, and then um, they um, they asked me to start playing with them. But it's kind of funny because I didn't have these picks with me. I think all those picks were in those guitars that I sold. So you I, quit making picks when you quit playing guitar? Yeah, wow. and I completely forgot about them. I mean, it was like it was erased from my memory, these picks that I made. So now I'm playing guitar again, right? And again, I'm unhappy with the picks that I'm finding when I go into the music stores. Mm -hmm. What is this junk? And I do. What the was same. the pick scene like at this point? What year is this? Like '95 or something? Yeah, mid '90s. Yeah, some, and then I started playing um, Jimmy Dunlop's picks again. I started playing those purple ones, the big stubbies. Uh -huh. They're called the big stubby, and they're mm -hmm. 3.0. Uh huh. I don't know why I didn't even think about I didn't it didn't even cross my mind about these picks that I used to make. And so I started doing the seashells and the wood again. And I even started grinding down uh full silver quarters, actual the silver ones. And and I still have them and silver fifty cent pieces. Wow. I can show them to you. And I just beat the snot out of the front of a Paul Reed Smith one time with a with a metal the metal coin pick Ooh. and um and then one day my daughter and i were cleaning out this closet because we we're remodeling the house this is just in california still mm -hmm. california still and i and i pulled out this old gig bag i pulled it out and i and it was a uh, scuba pro because i used to be a scuba diver mm -hmm. and i kept a bunch of junk in there and you know, i was pulling out like old humbucker pickups and old tuners and yeah. i think there was like a tube original ibanez tube screamer in there nice. that the battery was left in and it was just all rotted yeah, from the out. inside out and in the bottom of that thing i reached in and there was one of those old picks that I made. <laughs> it was the pick of destiny i was about to say that <laughs> just like that i, I just I remember looking at it like this, and it was real scratchy. It was about this size and shape, and I, I said, Audrey, Audrey's my daughter. I go, Audrey, Dad made this back in, like, 1982. This thing's been in here since 1982. And I just, and then I started remembering making those things. And, um, and I, I went down to the store, and I... Got the closest thing I could get again, and it was 2.75, still that thickness. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, they made it thinner too. For, mm -hmm. I think they made it for like, well, they make it for signs and putting over picture frames and sure. stuff like that. And uh, I started making them. And now this time we had the internet because it was like 2004. Mm -hmm. We had the internet. And, um, um, I started sending them to friends on the internet. And then you, you could do all kinds of research, and you could find vendors. Yeah, but, but I don't read very well. I can read, but I don't – let's let's put it this way. I don't like reading. I got you. And so I, I – no, I didn't do research. I just was on there chit-chatting with my friends and, the, mm -hmm. you know, different um, – the gear page is a yeah. fact. Okay, yeah, that would make sense. And um, we used to have this get-together over in San Francisco. It was called the Boys Club. We met in this airplane hangar, and I took, I made about 50 of them, and I took them to my buddies. We met about every three months. I took my buddies, I put them on the table. I said, everybody gets three. So they did. They each all took three of them. And, um, and one guy went onto the gear page, and he did this thing. Those stupid V-picks, he called it. That's what he called the article, those stupid v -picks. No, no. That must have been before they had the name. Did he mistakenly name the V-Picks? 
No, he didn't name the V picks. John Dean did. Okay, so that that wow. See, I've forgotten a lot of things. They already had the name at that point. So, but anyway, I went over to my buddy. And here's here's a story I got to tell you before that story. Sorry, okay. sorry. No, that's fine. I'm with you, man. We got an hour, right? Yeah, man. You're good. You're good. <laughs> so here's the dude. Here's the deal. I went over to John Dean's house because he was helping me grind down those coins. Mm -hmm. We were just farting around in his. Sure. In his, and I go, check this out, John. He goes, wow. Where'd you get this? I said, I made it in 1980. You should start making these. I go, I know. I'm, I'm already. I made dozens of them already. He goes, what are you going to name them? And I said, I don't know. Maybe Plexi Picks? That's what I, because they were Plexiglass, right? right. And he goes, John was brilliant. John John could come up with John was one of those people that he could he could say a line and make you crack up in a, in a second. Yeah, he was good to the point. He puncher. goes, "How about V picks?" And I thought that he called them that because they're shaped like a V. <laughs> I didn't know he called them that because it's Vinny. Vinny, I it was like three <laughs> months or maybe six months before I I caught caught onto that. So that's where they got the name V picks. And then Johnny and I went over to um to the Bay Area, to that meeting. That's what it was. And then we laid them out. And they didn't have logos on them or nothing because I didn't know how to do all that. Mm -hmm. And um, and they laid them on a table. And and then that's when the guy wrote the article, the stupid V-Picks. And what his whole point was, now he can't play with anything else because, oh, of, because, right of, these, yeah. because of these stupid picks that Vinny gave me. Mm -hmm. Now he owns me. That was basically his... And the, and the, and the I know what he's saying. I mean, that happened to me. Yeah, and and, and I think there was only like thirty thousand members on the gear page at that time. There's like three hundred or five hundred thousand members sure. now, or maybe three million. But it was a very small um, website then, and and it it is just, just we took a, we took a picture of it. But my daughter had a, had a had a disease, and we couldn't figure out what the disease was. And I was working twelve hours a day. I didn't have enough money to really to pay for her her hospital bill. This is kind of a sad part of the story. Mm -hmm. But this is true, and I like to tell this part of the story. And and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, and it was months. And well, does she have cancer? Does she have leukemia? Does she have this? Does she have that? And I remember coming home from, from the uh, hospital. They didn't know what was wrong with her. And I remember sitting at the stoplight, and it was red. And I, I remember thinking to myself, you know, sometimes you talk to God. Mm -hmm. We just do. I think even people that don't believe in him do mm -hmm. sometimes. And I remember saying, you know, God, they can't figure out what's wrong with Audrey. And I don't know how I'm going to pay all these doctor bills. I have no idea how I'm going to pay these doctor bills. I really need your help. That's what I said. And I remember the light turned green, and I made the left-hand turn going up Tully to my house. Two days later, this guy that I had given picks to calls me up and he goes, hey, dude, you need to quit giving those picks away. You need to start selling them. And here's where you're going to sell them. Because my wife kept telling me, you're out in the garage all the time making those picks and you're just sending them all over the world, giving them away. What's, what's the deal? You know, you need to start selling those. I said, nobody's going to buy those things. Who's going to buy a $5 pick? Mm -hmm. And she and so he goes. Well, he, and here's where you're going to sell them. And he pointed me at the gear page. So we took a picture, like this, just like that, in front of Audrey's piano. And uh, Nancy made this little website that cost us nine dollars and ninety five cents a month, which was a lot of money to me because everything was being trained. Sure. And and uh, and one guy said, "How much are you going to?" Well, the guy that was helping me. Mike Petras, she's a dear friend, dear friend of mine. He said, "How much are you going to sell them for?" And I said, "Gee, I don't know." And he goes, "Well, how long does it take you to make them?" And I said, "I can make. It takes me about twenty minutes." He says, "So you can make three an hour." I said, "Yeah, that's about right. By the time I buff them and clean them, I can make three uh -huh. an hour." And he said, "Okay, when you do a part-time job, you should always make fifteen dollars an hour because you've already done your job, you paid your taxes, and..." If you're going to do something on part-time, you need to make $15 an hour. Sure. So you need to sell those things for $5 a piece. 
I said, there's no way. Picks sell for 35 cents a piece. They mm -hmm. don't sell for $5. And he says, well, then how about this? How about you sell three for $12 and charge $3 shipping? I go, if you say so, Mike, whatever. I, I didn't believe anybody. So we did that website. Nancy pushed return. And I remember the day that the hospital bills were paid off. Wow, that's a great story. Man. I remember. I remember the day when when we when we paid off the hospital bills. Was it immediate? Like the yes. next day, you had orders. That hour, I had orders. Wow, wow. that's awesome. That's amazing. That hour, I had orders, and so um, it just. Then I figured, okay, well, thanks God, you know, <laughs> uh, you paid off our hospital bills, and I just figured it was over. Yeah. But it just never stopped. Yeah. And then the next thing I know, my wife comes up to me and she said, you need to quit your job. Uh -huh. uh, it's getting in the way of our business. Yeah. What? Uh -huh. I, I worked, I, I started working while I was like 14 years old. Sure. And because, you know, I never, we were not a rich family or sure. even, even middle class. We were up, you know, lower class. Yeah. And so we never had any money. So I worked all my life. And for me to quit a job that was paying my bills and and supplying me with health insurance and stuff, boy, I still have I still have nightmares. Not nightmares, but you can dreams. still feel the anxiety of that. <clears throat> yes, I can. And I and I still have dreams about uh, that I'm still working and thinking mm -hmm. about whether I'm going to quit that job. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's that's a, a sense of security road, yeah. for yeah, us. Yeah. You know. And um, yeah, and that's kind of that's that's, cool, that's where man. we are now. And when, and when did you move to Nashville? We moved to Nashville in 2011. Yeah, and we just became we raised our kids in California, but California started sliding downhill. Uh huh. And um, we just became disillusioned. And 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 uh, my wife looked at me one day, and she said, uh, "I want an adventure." I go, okay, what do you want? She goes, I want to move. I said, okay, do you want to move? Because we loved Hawaii and we loved Nashville. I said, you want to move to Hawaii or Nashville? <laughs> Just go find me a place to live. Mm -hmm. So she says, I want to move to Nashville. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so go find me a place to live. So I put her on a plane and she came out here and found, found us a ranch and found a very nice. You haven't been out to the place yet, but you should be. Okay. And um, she found us a really nice place to live and... We moved here right after the flood, so I, I knew mm. that the house didn't flood. The, the 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 utility barn way down in the horse area did. Mm -hmm. It was like a foot and a half of water in it. But but my V-Pick shop and our house did not flood. That's cool. And I knew that, so I, that's why. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought the place. And uh, we just never looked back. I didn't look in the rearview mirror when I drove out of California. I literally did not look in the rearview mirror. <laughs> That's great. Drove right down through Southern California and right through Barstow and mm -hmm. Arizona and out we came with our three Great Danes in our cars and big old Penske truck. And That's awesome, man. Well, I'm glad you did that. Yeah. and, and That's a fantastic... Uh, that's an American dream story right there. There's not too, is, many of a, too, too many of those left. It is. Um, and, and, and I have to tell you about the Carlos thing, too. Um, you know, I, I grew up playing Carlos Santana, uh, one of the first. And this is in the Bay Area? Yeah, I lived not far from Carlos. Yeah. Carlos lives in a place called Marin County. And sure. I, I lived in a place called Modesto, which is about an hour, hour and a half from Marin County. And um, so Carlos played high schools and everything around where I was. Mm -hmm. Then Carlos came out with the Abraxas album. Sure. And I learned a lot. I was a giant John Fogarty and, and Alvin Lee fan up to that point. And then once my brother-in-law gave me a, a Abraxas album, then, of course, I became a big Carlos fan. Uh, so I always had this dream of, wow, if I – now that I'm making picks, I wonder if Carlos would ever play. So this guy named David Workman called me up one day, order picks from me. He says, I want to make this order. And he gave me this order, and he said, and if you want, I have a friend named Carlos Santana, and if you want him to um, try out your picks, throw some in there for him. That kind of pissed me off because <clears throat> you're in business. You know how people kind of jerk you around sometimes. Sure. 
And I and I thought, ah, this guy's just, yeah. I go, yeah, yeah, okay, right. He goes, no, no, I know. You think I'm just trying to get free picks from you. This is what he said to me. He goes, but I'm telling you, Carlos is a buddy of mine, and if you want him to try your picks, okay, Dave, you're on. And it was, it was kind of that thing. I was kind of annoyed with the guy. We're dear friends now, by the way. But <laughs> So I did. I threw in some extra picks for Carlos. Two weeks later, my daughter, Audrey, again. Yeah. Hi, this is Santana Management. Oh, cool, she uh -huh. says. So then she calls me up at work. Dad, you got to call this number. It's Carlos's bodyguard. Carlos Santana, Dad. Uh -huh. Carlos Did Santana. she know who it was? Yeah, because I played a lot of his music. Uh -huh. So she knew who Carlos was. Matter of fact, when she was really little, one time she there was this game, look at, stare at this thing and then look at the wall and you see a picture of Jesus. Yeah. Well, she always thought that was Carlos Santana. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you, you know, you've seen the yeah, thing. I know, stare I know stare at that called. look. And yeah, yeah. She always thought it was Carlos. Anyway, so I, I called I called the number, and sure enough, there it was. It was Chad, and he was standing next to Carlos, and Carlos made this giant order with me. and and The rest is history. The rest is history. That's awesome, man. And he, he's, he's like, especially back then and still now, I mean – there's not very many guitar players that you could say to anybody and they know who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's Eric Clapton, yeah. everybody. I mean, even my mom knew who Eric Clapton sure. was. There's Carlos. There's Billy Gibbons. Not many. Not many, yeah. He's like Pharaoh. Car yeah, at he's the time, one. Carlos was Pharaoh. Sure. You know? And um, so that was... That really, once I put that on the website, Carlos is playing our picks. And then a picture of, you know, Carlos put me in a chokehold and had a bunch of pictures like that of right. Carlos and me. And um, that, that, that really, I think that helped our sales quite a bit. I'm sure, was he like the first really big artist you had? First big star, yeah, Carlos. And then I, I don't remember when Walter Becker and... I remember when Ed King started playing, you know, because Ed mm -hmm. was a big inspiration of mine. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't play my picks. I kept calling him. I don't even know how I got his phone number, but I kept contacting him. You know, he played, he played the solo on Sweet Home Alabama. Home Alabama. Yeah, absolutely. He played that with a seashell. You know, there's more mm -hmm. noise on that solo than there is. There's more pick noise on that than solo string noise. than there are. Yeah. yeah, than there is notes. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. If you really listen to that. He says that was the worst strat he's ever owned in his life. He hated that. <laughs> he was glad to give it to the Hard Rock Cafe. Um <laughs> And wow. he wouldn't play my picks. And then I moved out here. And then I'd talk to him once in a while. Ah, man, why don't you leave me alone, dude? And then one day, he just out of the clue blue sky, he called me up. He goes, okay, you got me. Uh -huh. I go, what did, what did I do? He said, this pick that's got 1980 on it, can you make it red? Uh -huh. I said, yeah, I'll do that for you. He goes, this is the one. I said, Ed, so funny you picked that out. That's the one I made in 1980 to sound like you. That's he goes, one. you made this pick to sound like me. I go, that's full circle. That's <laughs> exactly what I did. That's amazing. Uh, it is. It's a cool story, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Eddie's gone now. You know, <laughs> he's passed away. Eddie passed away. Yeah, about a year and a half ago. I he, just saw something about a guitar of his being auctioned. Yeah, the uh, Red Eye, the, the Les Paul. Uh huh. Yeah, Eddie had uh, he had to uh, have his heart replaced because uh -huh. he got that virus that killed his heart, uh -huh. and so he had to have his heart replaced, and then um, he that, succumbed to the... cancer after that. Uh, he smoked a lot, you know, when he was young. I didn't Every know picture that. you see of Leonard Skinner, he had a guitar, cigarette in his mouth or in his hand or in the head of his guitar. So he died of lung cancer. Yeah. Ouch. Only to some to come to that. You know. uh, that sucks, man. Something's going to get all of us, you know, sooner or later. Sooner or later. None of us are getting out of this boat alive. You know that. That's Cheers, true. man. Absolutely. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, Vinny, man, I'm glad you're a friend of the store and a friend of mine and everybody's here. And uh, I love your product and I'm so proud that we carry it here. And man, I, I want to thank you for doing this, man. Yeah. Yeah. Are we done? Yeah, we've been. Uh, we're an oh, hour, man. We're oh over my, an hour. My gosh, I talked for an hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope you could, were able to answer the questions. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, I wanted to get the story, man. So I think we got it. You guys, absolutely. Yeah. It's. Uh, you guys got anything to add? Mm. 
I think it's cool that we're bringing in uh, some of the premium picks. I didn't know that there was anything above what we offered. Yeah, I didn't know there were tiers. I, I wish I wish that you didn't. I wish that I would have told you guys. Uh, Larry and those guys knew from world, you know, from before. Yeah, uh, I'll bring you down. I'll bring you down uh, my whole line of premiums if you want. You nice. can just, you I can think just we could take move them, and, don't you? Yeah, Hank. Absolutely. Absolutely, definitely. Uh, uh, so a lot of the stores do here in town. Sure. Some of them don't want to deal with a ten dollar pick sitting there, waiting to be taken. Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, like I say, if you're missing a skew, just tell me you're missing a skew, and I'll replace it. It's worth it to me to get it into the customer's hands. It's a. It feels to the picks as far as the people that use them. It almost veers more towards. Not necessarily professional, but almost more of a, a skillful professional, for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. It's not really perusers or hobbyists yes. that yeah. are interested. It's not really the thieving type, I guess, that are interested in those. It's more the... People that want more out of their instrument. Yeah, it's exactly. Pro. Whether People they're, that know whether they're pro yeah. or not. Right. Yeah. Now, I have a lot, a lot, I th- and I don't know about who my customer base is because I only see their names. So I don't really know. Um but I suspect a large part of my customers are guys that play okay. I mean, they might be able to play a C and F and a G, and <laughs> some some of them go out and gig, but a lot of them don't. They just like to sit around and and they they like to have the best of the best of the best. And these are considered that you yeah. know these blue chip and red bear. Those are the three real biggies. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm really proud to be, you know, in, in that same absolutely man same list of names. Definitely, you know, Blue Chip. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, I was going to ask um, you, do, or do you have a relationship with us? Absolutely. Um, the guy from Red Bear, he lives in Nevada. Uh-huh. We've talking, we've spoken, you know, a bit on the phone. Uh, the guy from Blue Chip. Uh, did I say Blue Chip? I meant Red Bear. The guy from Blue Chip. Um, I see him at shows and stuff. And, uh-huh. Um, we're very friendly competition, competition nonetheless. Absolutely. But, and I tell him that I make better picks than him. What does he just <laughs> laugh? <laughs> yeah, he just laughs. He doesn't even play, you know. He owns a machine shop, and and they got this material in, and and one of his employees said, "Hey, that would make a great guitar pick." I guess it's really expensive stuff, really mm-hmm. expensive material. So he he'll tell you he doesn't even play, but he's man. I'll tell you, I wish that I had the foot in the bluegrass field that he does. Oh man, Boy, Boy, those people love yeah, that guy. Compromise, and man. blue and the bluegrass <laughs> contingent, they're very loyal. To. They love that guy. Yeah, absolutely. And um, matter of fact, Spigma's going on this weekend. I'll be there. Yeah, and he'll be there, and he could be selling a bajunior out of those things. <laughs> and but but if you'll notice now. Um, when you go to those, because I've done Spigma before and stuff, they'll take they'll open up their little tray and there'll be blue chips, but there'll also be a V pick in there. Right on. Because they'll, they'll tell me, well, I mostly play blue chips, but I play yours too. Absolutely. Vince Gill's same same way. For the most, he likes blue chip. For the most part, like just all my years of being in this business, like it is friendly competition. All the companies they like each other. Most, most of them. Do. Not, not everybody, but most. I know there's a, there's still some ripoffs, but yeah, we, pedal pedal companies get it, guitar companies yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it happens, you know. Absolutely. But it, generally speaking, yeah, we're all friends. It's like I'm I'm really good friends with Dragonheart's picks. Yeah. Have you seen his picks? I haven't seen them. Uh, they're uh, or Red Bear. We don't have Red Bear. Do I've never heard of Red Bear. Red Bear, uh, Dragonheart. I don't even know if Red Bear wholesales. He may or may not. Uh, but Dragonheart, he's got this, it's a different shape pick, uh-huh. and it's made out of some material that on his website, he's a sweetheart of a guy, just love him. He's a he's a, a veteran, mm-hmm. f- served our country sure. and everything. He's a great guy. And he calls me his hero. Well, uh-huh. I'm going to call him my <laughs> hero. I'm going to call him my hero. Um, but on, on the video on his website, he throws these things in a frying pan. Yeah, huh. and he's heating them up in a frying pan, <laughs> flipping them over, and they don't melt. <laughs> Interesting. I, I don't know what they're made out of, but I know it's a plastic, but I, I don't. Hmm. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is really very weird, strange. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, and so I'm, I'm good friends with, with a lot of these guys. Sure. I got a guy right now. He's 
Well, right. we, we know there's ones you're not friends with. Well, yeah, but we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't bring that up. Um, the one guy that I've just recently um, become friends with, matter of fact, he's sending me a guitar here. Just a, that, ni that nice of a guy. He's um, putting magnets in V-Picks now. He's got a patent. Magnets. He's got a patent on it. He what, actually what got a for? patent on it. He drills a hole in. Uh, he drills a hole in it. It's a flat magnet, flat round magnet, and he puts a magnet in. I guess for a, so you can stick it to your pickup or you can stick it to a mic stand or something. I don't know. Hmm. I got one hanging on my refrigerator. Yeah. Well, we, it would be a refrigerator. Oh, it would right be a refrigerator that. magnet that, for sure. That would definitely work. But he's doing it with the. Uh, he doing it with a screamer, the Dimension Junior, and the Mummy. You guys know the mummy. He's Absolutely. The mummy. That was your pick for a long time, wasn't it? I do like the mummy. I yeah. like the mummy a lot. So he's putting magnets in them. Putting magnets in them. So I thought there was some playing application for that, but you're probably right. It's probably just a stick. I and, don't know what the... And maybe it has to do... You know, some people believe in magnets with your arthritis and all Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe it's that. <laughs> he hasn't told me... As much as we've talked, he hasn't told me what the magnets do exactly. Huh. But they're strong magnets, and I'm a, I don't know, man. I'm, I'd be afraid it, <laughs> it'd go yeah. over to one of the pickups. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Our, our pickup, our pickup covers magnetic. I mean, the covers. I don't think. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, will, will the magnet, magnet stick to them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I'd be wondering about that. Anyway, uh, we're that's just getting the ball rolling, and and I'm getting ready to make a whole bunch of picks for him to do that. Wow. And, uh, it's just cool. another friendly little. Yeah, and Jimmy Dunlop's coming over to my yeah, house. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Jimmy's in town? Mm -hmm. That's really Jimmy's cool. Jimmy's in town, and they wrote me, and Jimmy Dunlop is coming to VPix Ranch tomorrow. That is very cool. I am very, cool. very honored. You should be. I am very... I, I've only met Jimmy one time. You know, he's 10 feet tall. Uh -huh. He's giant tall. Uh -huh. And he came up to me at NAM one time, and he shook my hand. He goes, hi, I'm Jimmy Dunlop. And I went... No, you're not. I, I didn't believe him. I just thought it was somebody messing with People mess with me all the sure. time. I go, no, you're not. He goes, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. And I go, no. Mm -hmm. I just didn't believe him. And he goes, Vinny, you sent me an email, and it said this, 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 and this. Now, who else is going to know that but me and you? And I went, you're Jimmy Dunlop. Wow. You are Jimmy Dunlop. So uh. he's going to come over tomorrow. That's really. I'm, I'm really, really cool. honored to have Jimmy Dunn. He's he's the he's the he's pick the, man of the world. Absolutely. Again, I make better picks than he does, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell him that tomorrow. But um, yeah, I mean, he's he, the guy. He's the guy. I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than that. That's so. the big guy. All right, man. Well, this was a lot of fun. It's a blast. Thanks, Vinny, man. You're the best, Absolutely. dude. Absolutely. I always love talking to you, man. It's, it's, it's so for you a, guys, and I'll be bringing more down. Such and, a cool thing that we, we get to uh, get to see you all the time and, and uh, talk to you. And you, I mean, you're, you're giving me so many picks. It's not even fun. If you fun. ever want to do like, this again, I'll let you talk next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. But it was great. We, like, we usually need to do a part two with certain yeah, guests. Yeah, there's certain guests definitely. that we do part, we're going to do part twos, like Jason, and there's a couple other people. But uh, yeah, man, we'd love to have you back. Yeah, I Anytime, love, man. I love you talking know about my picks and telling the story and half of my stuff you can't believe, you know, but. I know which you, two. You can believe. Go, you, go first, Will. I think you. I'm going to take that one. You take whatever you want. I'll, I'll bring you guys some more. Like I say, now that I, I didn't real, I didn't even think, think about bringing you guys some premium picks. Oh before. no, this was the. One. Uh, they're, they're really something though. They're special, aren't they? Dude, Pre premium I, picks are special. Oh, I, I feel like it's a really it's a step that, up. Actually, you think that that's your that's your your main squeeze right there? Huh? I think it might be. If you'll notice, it's buffed on one side and not buffed on the other. Yeah. I don't know. I have a whole. Wait a minute. No, no. That's the that's the three point oh. This is the one I'm talking about. This orange this one. one. That's the one that's buffed on one side, and not on the other. <laughs> that's a good one too. Hank, you got anything you need to say? Plugs. There's a writers' round February sixth here at the at World Music Nashville, right? Yes, sir. That is correct. Any other gigs coming up? 
that's that's the only that's like the closest one we have. Okay. Uh, Community Arts of Bellevue also this weekend they're doing a writers round. Okay. Saturday and Sunday. You're playing at Acme this Friday. Acme, <clears throat> five to seven this Friday. Yep. The heck? That's the very last one. How's uh, that stage doing? Didn't that stage collapse or something? I don't. I, I don't know. Isn't that the place <laughs> where the the roof there was too much water on the roof and the caused the stage to crack and collapse or something? Is that maybe it was a different venue? Maybe the, Johnny used to play there all the time. On the bottom floor, I I don't, I don't think so. that's where we're playing. But there's multiple floors. So oh, maybe, there is. Mm -hmm. Okay, I bet you that's what it was then. Yeah. yeah one of them, the stage collapsed. Damn. Pretty sure that's because Will was rocking out so hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> All right, man. Wait a second. Thanks, Vinny. That was good. Excellent. It was fun. Right Very loose.